I'm Greg Johnson. I'm founder and CEO of Aquaport Technologies, and we are developing some material technologies and engineering solutions to solve some of our grandest water challenges here in the 21st century. Well, it's great to have you, Greg. Uh, first episode of something new, what it is, TBD, but this is the first episode of a new format, so we can say that for sure. And uh, I think there's some irony. We're talking about stormwater, rainwater here from two places, apparently, that don't get enough of it. I'm in the L.A. area. You're in Spokane, Washington, which you said has been an unseasonably dry this uh, winter. So what is this fascination and you know, how did you get into this strange and bizarre and interesting line of work? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's been a very circuitous route to get to this point. And I realized with my intro, that was pretty bold, All right, We're out to solve some of the grandest challenges around water. Um, yeah. But I, I think, you know, it all started over 15 years ago now. Um, our first company at the time, uh, my co-founder Kevin and I, we were importing water pervious paving tiles from China. And the way we got into that, I was working, uh, I guess, dipping my toe into the world of real estate and real estate development. And he was actually at college and, and we were friends. We'd always share ideas, sort of like, you know, just entrepreneurial. We had the entrepreneurial bug and we'd share business ideas and, and whatnot. And he was in a class and they were talking about green infrastructure and he was friends with a kid in that class who was an exchange student from China. And they were talking about stormwater in this class. And the kid kind of nonchalantly says, you know, my family uh, is part owner of this refractory business, like uh, a business in China they, that makes bricks. So a brick factory. And he said one of their products was this porous paver, this porous paving tile. And in China, they were using it um to sort of get rid of standing water and at the same time i'm over here doing my thing trying to figure out the you know real estate development world and one of the biggest pain points developers would always talk about when they're developing a property had to do with these stormwater requirements and so having to keep whatever falls whatever rain falls on your property you have to manage that and the solutions at hand at that time were expensive they took up too much space um, there are all these issues and, you know, Kevin tells me this and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Have them send a sample. I think there's like a market for something like that in America. And they did. And um, we did some research and come to find out permeable pavement has been around for decades okay. um, in the United States. And the theory or the concept around permeable paving, I think, is right on the money. But there's a reason we don't see it more widespread and it really has to do with the material limitations of those technologies. And so they sent a sample over and we started, you know, doing our due diligence on it. And we're like, this is better than what's out in the market today. So we started that business and I won't bore you with those details, but the long and short Thank of it God. is that was a, Oof. yeah, I, <laughs> I know. I was about to fall asleep over here. Yeah. <laughs> no, just yeah. kidding. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. Yeah. Um, the, the long and short of it was, uh, quality control issues, you know, shipping something very heavy halfway across the world. Um, we didn't speak the language and so we were getting crap product and then we had no recourse, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so we kind of figured out really quickly that was going to be a hard business to scale. But at the same time, there was a lot of interest and we were creating demand. And so. You know, when we realized it was time to fold up that shop, we had met a material scientist, like this brilliant engineer that was working on a cement, a new cement technology here. We got with him, showed him what we were trying to do with the permeable concrete. He started prototyping. We were blown away and we're like, all right, let's start Aquapore. Wow. And the rest is kind of history. Wow. And that was eight years ago, right? That you kind of began this yep. venture more or less? We started okay. Aquapore eight years ago, and then we were working with him, though, a good two and a half, even three years before we started Aquapore. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I mean, you, you went from a more traditional business model, the obviously uh, importing something from China to manufacturing something yourself. Um, and you mentioned the beginning. Well, there, there are several aspects of climate um, action and change that you're trying to solve for here. So what is, let's start with the water issue, the storm water, the standing water. What, what is that issue and why is traditional concrete bad for just that before we get into the rest of it? Yeah. 
Well, traditional concrete, uh, we take it for granted because there's so much of it. And in the end, I mean, concrete is really one of the more uh, amazing materials um, of recent generations. You know, it's, it's built our cities. Um, it's done a good job of keeping water out, channeling yeah. water, uh, you know, building bridges and buildings. It's, it's very important. But the problem is it's come at a cost now because we've urbanized in our cities with so much concrete and asphalt and it's you know all impervious to rainwater and the problem is now we're getting rain events where it rains that water has to go somewhere we have engineered systems to treat that water but they're being overwhelmed and so where does that water go then well it's designed to go into the nearest bo uh, body of water and so in la it's you know santa the monica the, yeah. yeah santa monica bay uh, in Spokane, it's the Spokane River. And keep in mind, you know, all that storm water is wrought with toxins, environmental stressors, all the crap that's on the street. So that's one issue. Um, the second issue is it contributes to localized flooding. And then, of course, you have, you know, property damage. Lives can be at stake um, when you get really big rain events. And then the third big issue that people gloss over and they don't think about is, well, you're not getting water back into the ground, but over 90% of all the water we use or consume comes from groundwater. And we're tapping those resources uh, to a level that's completely unsustainable, you know, over yeah. the next coming decades. So sort of threefold problem. Yeah. And that's the reason why every time I go swimming in Santa Monica, I come back with a healthy green radioactive glow. I Yeah. I just, I shine. If I turn off a light and my hair seems to fall out at an alarming rate. Um, and pink eye and yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, all all the things. Yeah, swimmer's yeah. ear, all <laughs> yeah. those nasty things, right? Swimmer's ear, whatever, whatever right. that is. Um, okay. So there's a twofold problem. And, and of course, in a place like here where the water situation is so pronounced and possibly even dire, losing that rainwater is a big, big, big deal. If we're taking what could be potentially good water and it's going into the ocean where it just becomes unusable instantaneously, that's a massive problem, especially like you said, we have these aquifers and we have such a shortage of groundwater. And I mean, maybe now we've had a couple rainy seasons and maybe we're doing slightly better than we were a few years ago. But even still, this problem is far from over, far from solved. So if we have a porous material, the essence is the water can seep through. And what's also interesting is that it filters out the chemicals and leaves them on the top, which is kind of fascinating. I have a water filter system, a Berkey filter, which I love, and it filters the yeah. water. So I assume it's somewhat of a similar concept, maybe by accident. The water drains through it, and then it goes into the ground or into uh, sources of water below. So if all of our concrete were replaced, all of our ground pavement were replaced, would that automatically be a better situation just as is in terms of water? I think it certainly would be. And okay. the beauty is with what we're trying to do, we're not even saying replace everything. We're saying mm -hmm. just in certain portions of the city. And of course, engineering is a huge piece of this. And so, yeah. you know, again, not to get into boring details, but before you put any permeable concrete down, you need to actually account for natural hydrology and structural issues. You know, there's certain things you have to consider, but, you know, say even 10% or 10 to 20% of the interior, the urban core was permeable, you're going to solve a huge issue. And we've even done the math. Um, this is all internal, like we have to prove this out. But in Los Angeles, you take a neighborhood and you put a mile of just permeable, aquaport permeable sidewalks, just one mile over the course of the year, we're going to get 2 million gallons back into the ground. Wow. And like in L.A. County, what I'm hearing is they have 9,000 miles of sidewalks that need to be repaired over the next 10 years. And I'm like, wow. well, what if 1,000 miles of that uh, was permeable? You could start millions solving some Millions and millions issues. of gallons is yeah. what's at stake here. That's truly mind-blowing. I didn't even realize the extent of that. Um, okay, so what is the... Um, the barrier to doing this? Why don't cities or municipalities realize this is something that we should just do and flip that switch and never look back? They're slowly coming around. I think one of the big issues um, 
for one, cities move very slowly and they're very path dependent. And so they're going to go with technologies and solutions that they've come to know and, and they understand, um, you know, over the last 20 years, they've done things or 50 years a certain way. They're familiar with permeable pavement. I think permeable pavement has been chastised over the years because of those past technologies. They're prone, to a couple things. Number one, they're brittle, okay? So they're weaker and they're prone to clogging up very quickly. The reason for that is because the void space throughout the material is so big. So it can take on a ton of water, but all the particulates, all the sediment that's in stormwater will clog those materials up very quickly. And so what we're doing, our technology is totally different. It is very much like a filter where the pore size is measured at the submicron level, which is mm -hmm. tiny. And so it's a new technology and it's just getting cities to get comfortable enough, specifying it and, you know, kind of scaling up. And quite frankly, we laugh uh, amongst our team all the time. We're like, well, we took on probably the most difficult thing you could, you know, theoretically take on where you're, you're reinventing concrete. It needs to be permeable. It needs to be just as strong as normal concrete. By the way, it needs to filter, you know, <laughs> total suspended right. solids and tire wear particles and all these things. And, and never and, be uh, replaced. And never be replaced. It needs yeah. to last a hundred years. And yeah, so. Yeah. And do you think you've achieved that? It doesn't need to be replaced? Well, I, I can't say or that. Less but often, I guess. or le Less often, for okay. sure. And we yeah. again, we need to prove it. We need to have it in the ground for yeah. 10 years and make those claims. But yeah. the technology, uh, it's a metal phosphate-based concrete, which it, in essence should last longer than normal concrete just because right. of how it's made. Well, I don't think you're taking on the world's most difficult problem. I think that would be making this show popular. That's much more challenging. <laughs> Maybe this is the episode that does it. Yes. This you know, is the I new would, format. I, I feel never, it. I can feel it. I would it. never give myself that much credit. Yeah, yeah. You no. see, j j just, you know, we'll walk a mile in each other's shoes and see. <laughs> that's um, right. But that's that's truly fascinating. And, you know, that brings up an interesting point that a lot of people think of concrete as this permanent thing or as this fixture. We're building miles and miles and all of our cities are built in, on concrete and China perfectly exemplifies that, speaking of, with these gigantic uh, buildings and apartment buildings in these cities that are going unused, just pouring tons and tons of concrete, and then they're tearing down all of these cities that aren't being used. So concrete, Crazy. contrary to our perception of it, is not permanent, and it doesn't last forever, and it does need to be replaced, and it's also an impending ecological disaster because it just sits there. And what do you do with it once it's no longer useful, right? When you, you break it up, you haul it to where? Where does it go? And um, what we kind of hinted at earlier is the, the resource intensity of producing this substance that is ubiquitous in urban life. So in addition to dealing with it, because it's not permanent, talk to me about creating it and what resources go into it? Because that's another very fascinating angle of what you're up to. Yeah, we we are very, it's a very different technology than normal, traditional Portland cement-based concrete. And so the reason concrete's uh, ecological footprint is so large and, it, and it's harmful is because of the use of normal cement to make concrete. And so think of cement as just the thing that binds everything together, it makes it strong. Well, Portland cement uh, is produced in, in a manner that's extremely CO2 intensive. And in, in the production of normal Portland cement, I think the estimate is that um, the industry is responsible for like 8% of the world's CO2 emissions wow. every single year. And, you know, those cement plants, most of them are run on coal. So they use coal to sort of fire those plants. Our technology is very different. We use no Portland cement. It's an assemblage of industrial minerals, one of which um, is one of the most abundant, you know, resources on Earth's crust. So it's everywhere. And then we use water and what we call a catalyst, which is it's a very light acid, if you will, that comes from agribusiness. So this is all byproduct of industry that's already sitting out there. We don't need to take material into a kiln, blow off CO2. Um, so right out of the gates, our technology, we estimate it's going to be about 85 to 90% lower CO2 footprint 
than Damn. concrete. Wow. With our, our only footprint really being, you know, freight, right? We have to get materials from point A to point B. So right. um, it's just inherently low carbon. We call it inherently green. Hmm. That's interesting. So. so do you think there's enough of these byproducts to make this truly scalable? Could it replace all? For thousands of years, potentially. Okay. Um, it, 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 the material we use is not going anywhere. It's, uh, there's piles of it sitting around. The other beautiful thing about our process is you hit on it too with normal concrete. You tear down a building. Where does that all go? Most of it gets landfilled. Mm -hmm. um, with our material, you can break it down and you can create like synthetic aggregate that goes right back into the mix and you can recycle, you know, everything that we use just to make more product. So no it's, way. uh, it, it really is a full kind of full life cycle type product that we can continue to recycle and make new material with. That's awesome. I had no idea about that. So what is this, uh, fly ash that I've seen from your website? Can you explain a bit about that? Sure. Um, fly ash is, uh, it's a product that comes off of, uh, coal production and it's one of the byproducts we've used, or we've at least tested going back in the mix. And it's just a way to get, you know, a carbon intensive product out of the, um, I guess the stream of, you know, industry and back into a useful product. And, uh, it's, it's something we've tested and used and we can use it. It's not ideal. There's some other things we can do with fly ash that don't have to do with making permeable concrete necessarily. But, um, I guess the easiest way to put it, it's just a byproduct from coal fired power plants that mm -hmm. uh, is dirty. It's nasty. It sits in retention ponds and it gets landfilled and there's other uses for it yeah. besides okay. leaching into groundwater. <laughs> Yeah, right, which is my it's favorite cool. hobby. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So is there any use of this that you wouldn't like to see it in? Obviously, with the porous nature being ideal for wicking water away, could you make other infrastructure from this? Would you make other infrastructure like buildings or foundations or any of that? Or would you expressly not? Expressly not, except for okay. one situation where there's high water tables. Um there's something we could do with it for housing foundations that, uh, and again, I won't get into the nitty gritty of that, but there's a use there. But in terms of structural, you know, building, we, you wouldn't want to use a permeable concrete for that. Bridges, you know, high rises, definitely not. Is there a version of this that is sustainable in the 85, 90% lower footprint that's not permeable from the same process that could replace? There is. Yep, there is. Okay. Um, in fact, we uh, we have a sister company that's working on that technology. And um, that's actually something we're super excited about. Um, it's a ways down the road, though. And, and I think ultimately, that's where we want to go. But also, keep in mind, you know, the cement industry is huge and incumbents are not going to go down easily. <laughs> no. The other thing I'll God, add is no. there's some... No, there, there's some other companies too working on variations of green cement or green concrete that yeah. are almost to market. And actually, I wouldn't even consider them competitors. I'm cheering them on because I think it's vastly needed. Mm. Well, that's one of the beauties of the eco space, right? Is that competition takes on a slightly different meaning than traditional business. And that's kind of why I enjoy talking about it because yeah. there is a greater mission. And the reason that you're in this business is the same reason that somebody else is in their business. And we're trying to solve this problem that up until recently, nobody even seemed to be aware of was a problem, let alone tried to solve it. So I'm with you, right? I have a vested interest in all of these people succeeding and figuring out many different ways to replace these harmful materials. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, concrete is just one of those things. And we've said it before on this show that there has really been no plan to draw it down. And it's one of the four massive things that prevent us from being unsustainable in the future. And even all of our other ecotech, you're talking about solar farms, you're talking about windmills, all of these other things, hydroelectric dams. You can't build that without these other materials like concrete 
plastic, exactly. steel, yeah. right? So there's no plan, even in a green future, to get away from some of these fundamental wasteful resources. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge. Whereas electricity or energy, I don't think that's going to be a challenge at all in the future. But all of the infrastructure that enables that, that will be a challenge. Do you think that that's it's su- it's reasonable? Such a good, it's such a good point. It's, yeah. I mean, you know, I see people banding about um, about different renewable energy solutions and people are talking about nuclear and, and it's great. I'm like, yeah, um, let's look at nuclear and let's go full steam ahead. But keep in mind, I mean, you still have to build nuclear power plants and what are you going to build it with? It's, you know, that's a lot of concrete. And that concrete is being made with Portland cement that goes through a process that uses coal-fired heat. <laughs> to create yeah, exactly and so yeah your your point's spot on yeah so is it actually easier to make it porous or not porous with the nature of the material is the default that it is somewhat porous and like what's the greater challenge um it is the default with the underlying technology is it will go to porous material okay. now but to get permeability so, so to get like high flow rates of water there's one more step that we have to take that basically we do apply some light heat. It's mm-hmm. a very low heat process at the end of the manufacturing uh, mm-hmm. process that creates the permeability. But the default for the product really is a, a porous, microporous technology. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. So I've seen at this point that you've gotten some, uh, you know, I think it was CBS featured you, which is great. You had a a film crew that came out, Innovation Nation or whatever it was called, which is really cool. I've also seen that you have been an advocate and worked after crowdfunding. So I'm kind of curious, what has been your best vehicle so far in eight years for getting this company off the ground? Has it been mostly crowdfunding? Are you seeking institutional investors? How have you been pitching this and where have you you had the most success? Yeah, we've uh, crowdfunding has been really integral to what we're doing. Um, initially, we brought in some money from um, they'd be like I'd say industry type partners, but they're local, they're more regional, and so we have kind of that social proof of you know concrete companies and people in the construction industry that put up the very early money to kind of get things started, and then we turned to crowdfunding because we realized it was going to take a lot of R and D. It was going to require some patient capital, and uh, it's not like you know software technology where you create a minimum viable product over the weekend and take yeah. it to market. Like yeah. this was going to take a lot of doing, and so crowdfunding has been that great avenue because I think looking toward institutional type money, even if it's an angel group or venture capital. Um, you get on that treadmill and I think it could be detrimental for a startup like this where they're going to have a, they're going to own a huge percentage of the company and you're going to be on their kind of growth trajectory. Right. Whereas this is just taking a ton of patience. Like we're building something that's truly hard tech and it's like physical material that goes into heavy industry. Yeah. Um, crowdfunding's kind of satisfied that need for capital continue to come in and then we can build this at our pace. That's amazing. And and have people been generally responsive or what messaging have you touched on do you think that's been most effective in selling this to crowdfunders or just anybody? You know, I think crowdfunding has come of age. So we're, we're seeing, uh, we've done a couple crowdfunds now and we're seeing that the individual investors become more sophisticated, which is actually super valuable. And I think Hmm. when the Jobs Act was passed in 2012, you know, Obama passed the Jobs Act and crowdfunding came out of that. Um, I think the goal was to give everyday investors the chance to invest in private companies like this and hopefully understand how investing at this level works. And I'm seeing that uh, up close and, and personally. But I think the message that's really resonated with people is they're everyday investors, but they're sort of impact oriented, right? They know yep. that in their own community, um, water, they have their own water challenges and just hitting on that and kind of contextualizing it, what we're building in context or, you know, in the view of maybe it's flooding in their community, maybe it's stormwater runoff pollution that's going into the Chesapeake, yep. um, you know, pick your water body, just 
I think kind of bringing it home to people has really resonated and people are like, oh yeah, we have this issue in our town and I can see how this could help. Yeah, so. And I've actually talked to somebody who, the, the owner of Rapid Radicals, which is treating the sewage problem from storm because it's an enormous, you know, sewage backs up. What do you do with all that? There are many angles to this problem. By the time this episode airs, it will have been a distant memory, I'm sure, as we in L.A. are in the middle of a horrendous drought. But at the time of this taping, we've had quite a lot of rain, some death, um, mudslides everywhere. Do you think that this type of tech could alleviate those aspects of heavy rain and extreme weather events? I think it could certainly mitigate some of the impact. I, mm -hmm. You know, no way we can solve the whole issue, right? Yeah. But I think what it does is it gives cities an augmentative tool to be able to implement more and more of this to help, again, mitigate or alleviate those impacts. And the other thing is I think the more permeable space a city has, now when instead of going and spending $500 million on expanded gray infrastructure, they can size that infrastructure more appropriately to implement much more green infrastructure and getting water into the ground where it falls. And so, yes, I think we can alleviate some of that problem. We can't solve it completely, but with a full suite of tools, I think cities can do a much better job of being more adaptive to these extreme weather events, which we're just going to see more and more and more of. Mm. They're not yeah. going anywhere. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there a reality where an individual, let's say somebody has a property or a yard where they could put this underneath and collect that water for their own use, let's say? I mean, I've seen these homes. I don't know. There's this show that Apple TV had a while ago. I think it was called Home. And there were some really interesting concepts of future modern homes. There was one where it was a house inside of a greenhouse, so a full house oh, wow. and a greenhouse. Yeah, incredible stuff. And so the house was surrounded by plants. And you're in the middle of this freezing place in Sweden that's just icy. But inside is a balmy, tropical, humid environment where these plants are thriving. And the human heat with the greenhouse and the solar energy is creating this awesome ecosystem. The water that they're using, so they can't use chemicals in their shampoo or any of these things that would be bad for their, their water table. But um, the water that they use when they take a shower goes into the plants, it gets regenerated, and they're basically keeping tons of this water in their home. It's 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 an unbelievably wow. inspiring thing. If I mean, Worth looking up for sure. Just something yeah. else like, yes, I want that. As soon as I can afford that, I want that. Do you think there's a reality where somebody with the use of technologies like this could keep some of the water that lands on their property for their own use and then reduce their dependency on outside water sources in general? I, I certainly think so. I think it could be yeah. uh, kind of like a high-powered or you know, high tech cistern. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, and I need to look into it more. I think there are some jurisdictions that like outlaw that it's like illegal really? to do. Yeah. I know it's crazy. Um, what's I don't the know reasoning? That... I mean, aside from <sighs> lobbyists, like what would be the, I don't know. Uh, maybe they think it's a health issue or something. Okay. I don't know. Something to research. I, that just mm. popped in my head and I'm going to, I'm going to look into that. There's actually a guy in Tucson, and I can't remember his name, but he uh, he kept seeing this problem. Tucson gets no rain. They get like 10 or 12 inches a year. Yeah. But when it comes, you know, it comes and causes flooding. And um, he went in and he started cutting, like making curb cuts so that he could, he wanted to get rid of the runoff. And he's like, just make curb cuts and then channel the water into yards where it can be treated naturally and um he got in trouble for that and then i feel like that's where i heard about the cistern thing maybe he had some cisterns and he was yeah there's certain jurisdictions where you can't for whatever reason take storm water and you know recirculate it onto your property but he kept doing it and now it's part of their code in the city is like his solution so now it's like mandated that people okay. uh make curb cuts and Anyway, I'm butchering the story. Uh, it's pretty cool. But it's though. possible. It yeah. Yeah. It was the guy who's just like, I've had enough and here's a way to solve it and I'm just going to do it. Right. So it's like yeah. with solar panels, you're reducing your dependency on the grid. And when you need grid power, you take it, right? And you're charged for the grid power you take. But if you could reduce your need for that grid, I mean, how is that a bad thing? Even if it's not potable water, there are so many uses of water in a home that you don't even have yeah. to drink or that wouldn't even be a health hat, like watering your lawn or any of these Rewater. other things, right? 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or toilet water, right? Why does that need to be? Couldn't that yeah. be just something that we've saved? Um, yeah. So I'm, I, that's comforting because I thought you were going to give me the opposite answer to that story. Where you're going to say he was just shut down and that was the end of it and progress will never succeed. Yeah, um, no. they. Uh, but he made a change. He made a change and, cool. and they went with it. So That's yeah. awesome. Well, I guess that kind of brings me to my next point and the crux of what this episode and the show is all about. Um, you're in this space. You've been in it for more than eight years, obviously. So you're intimately familiar with the existing systems and the lobbies and all of the entrenched players. And you're also familiar with the challenges and the potential solutions. Would you say that you're fundamentally optimistic about the way these things are heading? Or are you more pessimistic? Are you cynical? Do you feel that we're heading on the right track or not? I'm eternally optimistic. Um, yep. I know that uh, there's a lot of noise and, and it can be frustrating too when you're in the mix because you want people, decision makers to be able to move more quickly. And you see kind of these existential threats that we're confronted with and it's like, well, let's do something now. But, you know, people move slowly, but people are moving. And I also think that there's so many bright minds in the space, uh, not just like what we're doing, but you think about all climate tech right now. I think there's so many brilliant minds um, working on these things that uh, I see nothing but progress. And yeah. it doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. But um, in the end, I'm totally optimistic about the future. Okay. So you were originally bitten by the entrepreneurial bug, as you said at the beginning of this, but now you're sort of on a slightly different path than the traditional entrepreneurship, which is just product market fit, make as much money as you can. I think you have a mission that might be slightly greater than just making as much money as you humanly can, um, which again is what makes it more interesting for me to talk with you about. Um, do you think... Um, that that mission has changed the way you look at your work or your difficult times, knowing that you chose the most, the second most difficult path to making this podcast popular, uh, <laughs> the, the second most difficult path in the world. Do you feel better yeah. during those hard times because you believe you're working on a solution? Does that give you some sort of comfort or does it really not matter? It, it, it does. It definitely does. Um, it's it's been a long journey and the funny thing is um when we started out we were delusional because we were like oh we're going to start this we're going to get it to market it's going to blow up and we will you know exit the company in like 2017 or 18 and yeah. we're going to make all this money and the entrepreneur's dream right when you do a startup and uh but then we got into the you know the daily grind and we saw how difficult this was going to be. Um, and yes, you keep that big picture, the big mission in mind, but this will sound weird, I guess. It's been so fascinating for me. So I'm non-technical. Okay. Like educationally and, and just, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a scientist. Um, the engineer and scientist that I work with on a daily basis, just seeing the work that he does and learning and understanding the technology, no matter how anything ends up for me, I will look back and be like, that was one of the greatest experiences of my life is just being up close and personal to seeing how something like this gets built. And so I guess my point is, um, I've just really learned to enjoy the journey. Um, mm -hmm. it's been pretty fruitful and, that being said, you know, there's days where you're like, why are we doing this? Yeah. I have three kids at home, you know, oh, wow. a mortgage, you know, all the things. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, just to keep the lights on, you're like, can we just hit it big? And then like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I've just, uh, I've kind of gotten to the mode where the journey matters a lot. And it's really the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. And we'll be rewarded by the work that we do, you know, and if it never comes to be, uh, so be it. I mean, I, I think in the end, it's like, we think what we're working on is meaningful and that gets us up every day. And I think you can hopefully take some comfort in knowing that you're actively working on the solution, which is something that most people can't claim. Yeah. Yep. 
I mean, it, it gets, uh, yeah, there's times I'm, I'm good now. I'm in a great place now, but there, right, was, good. <laughs> yeah, there were times where you see your friends and you see your peers oh, and yeah. you know, they're buying second homes and they're investing yeah. in this right. and they've got the lake place and, and you're like, man, you know, I'm trading my life for this yep. and, uh, but it's worth it. I would not trade it ever. Yeah, that's an interesting point in a person. You know, I, I posted recently on LinkedIn that it's, you know, there's that old adage that it's it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And I said, it's it's not a sprint, it's an ultra sprint-a-thon. It's a marathon that lasts much longer. Totally, <laughs> it's a sprint yeah, that lasts better. much longer than a marathon, yeah. right? And like you find yourself in that second phase where the first thing didn't quite work out or like, or it didn't, the timeline wasn't there. And I'm in sort of an opposite business because I have a, an agency, I have a service-based business, I have a marketing agency. And you know, of course, there's the possibility that you sell an agency for many millions if your revenue is high enough and all of that and your processes are tight. But, you know, I've, I've had mentors and they're like, yeah, what's your plan to exit the company? Because some entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs are like, you should do this for five years max and then move on to the next thing and exit and all of that. And then there's that moment where you realize like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in it for a while. <laughs> like this is, yeah. I'm going to be here for a while. So it better get comfortable with it. And, you know, maybe you'll make gains and they'll be marginal or they'll be slow or slower than you thought. But it is another thing that kicks in when you recognize, okay, this is, this is my life now. And it's not just yeah. a means to a very quick other end. And maybe you feel that a little bit too. I do. I do. And it makes you, it gives you that endurance, you know, you, right. you can kind of, you can kind of stick it out. Um, so yeah. And then, you know, it's hard, right? Because we live in a hyper-connected world and, you know, yeah. we're on social media and, you know, people are faking their lives there and you're like, Oh gosh, I gotta, I gotta get my, get my act together. And, but you know, the right. reality is we all walk our own path and, uh, I'm super comfortable with the path that we've, mm. we've chosen. So. So that actually brings up a very interesting point because a lot of the entrepreneurial podcasts or media, they talk about, I don't want to say get rich quick schemes, but they're all about the money without any of the substance. And a lot of times they're selling that with a YouTube thumbnail. This person, he made $2.4 million a year with zero employees with some sort of, uh, you know, software, God knows what, let's call it <laughs> bullshit, um, yeah, some kind yeah. of piece of crap, but somehow they've done it. And then, of course, you have the younger generation and so many people who say, like, wouldn't that be the dream? to make $2.4 million a year, zero employees, zero hassle, solopreneur, off in Bali somewhere, sipping Mai Tais on a beach, you check your email, you know, the Tim Ferriss four-hour work week kind of propaganda yeah. that's out there, um, versus other people who say, you know, I want to make some kind of meaningful change. It's not all about maximizing my personal benefit and not caring. How do you see that? And how do you think that we can market these ideas for lack of a better term? How can we convince somebody that it might be better to tackle these big problems versus just get as much money as you can in the most effortless way out of the system, regardless of whether you're contributing anything or not? I think it's a steady drip of, um, I don't, uh, glamorizing isn't the word, but shining a light on, I think, some of the things that don't work anymore. And, and we, I guess what I'm getting at is we have environmental issues, post-industrial systems and processes that served us for a long time. And now they're starting to um, rear their ugly head in terms of what it's cost us environmentally. And I think yeah. um, just highlighting those things, you know, the podcasts and, and all the things that we see with kind of these get rich quick scenarios or they highlight entrepreneurs that have done that. I, when I see those, I, I see what I can take away from that is like, mm. well, maybe there's something I can learn from this person's system or yeah. whatever, you know, worked for them. But I think what I'm sensing is the younger generations now, the Gen Z uh, generation, now that we've gone through, and there are a lot of people that made a lot of money during what I call the ZERP phenomenon, zero interest rate phenomenon, mm. a lot of startups mm -hmm. that were worthless, not worthless. I mean, they made money. You had entrepreneurs and, yeah. and founders exit for a lot of money, and it's like their product doesn't do anything for humanity. Right. You got a lot of that. But now I think Gen Zers are seeing like, okay, it's a different economy. It's a different day and age. And they're more attuned to some of the problems that have been created by that sort of get rich at all, by all means, you know, 
sort of mentality. And so yeah. I think they're already attuned to it, but I think just highlighting, um, there's opportunity to solve some of these issues. And I do think the first or next trillionaire, there are probably already trillionaires out there, will be someone that <laughs> yeah, finds yeah, out how, how to I crack the right. code yeah. with clean energy, clean water, clean. Yeah. It's going to be an environmental um, type entrepreneur, I think, that you know is going to be um, rewarded. Wouldn't that be incredible? That'd be the one type, right? Hey, yeah. we're going to make it. <laughs> our, our, your kids, their kids, they might have a chance. Wouldn't that be a comforting thought? It'd be nice, yeah. <laughs> In a world where so many people are seriously doubting, and I've talked about this subject, they're seriously doubting having kids at all. Many people say, fuck that, because they're just so afraid of what the future holds. And I have a daughter. I have another one on the way, so coming up on Congrats. two. Congrats, yeah. And of course those thoughts go through. You can't be a rational and intelligent person without thinking, like, shit, am I making a mistake here? You know, like, I'll probably be good for at least another 20, 30 years, maybe, but will she yeah. be good? Will they be good? I don't know. It's, it's scary, it's scary. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you take that leap of faith, and then you sort of remind yourself that so many people in history have taken that leap of faith. And it's part of the human psyche and condition to do that or to yeah. try to listen to the voice of optimism when the voice of pessimism and cynicism is so loud in your head and in the media all around you. I mean, even just looking at the news these days, it's just an, it's an assault on the senses. It is. And you think, my God, we're screwed. It is. I know. You have to protect your uh, protect your sanity that way because you're right. I think you, you go down those rabbit holes and it's the, it's like the world's ending. It, it can make you very pessimistic. Yeah. But um, history rhymes. I mean, this is we've been through all these things historically before, and uh, I don't know. I'm still optimistic, and good, good for you having a. <laughs> A second. Have another and hey, another. Right? Three, need... yeah, three. Oh, God. That's a practical yeah. challenge. That's a logistical yeah. nightmare. <laughs> I don't think I could deal. Like, one was hard enough. I'm terrified of two. Terrified. One is one. One is one. Two is 10. And three is like 30. And yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I literally cannot comprehend this. And I have good friends. They have three and a fourth on the way. And I'm like, what is the matter with you people? Yeah, like, yeah. how? Just yeah. literally how? How can you do it? I'm so hats off for making it work. Yeah. Um well it's been super inspiring chatting with you. And I guess the last bit before we wrap things up is, you know, are you still seeking crowdfunding? Where can people support your work or where can they contribute and be a part of it if they're interested? We we are. We have a crowdfund that's live at the moment, um, for the next couple months at least. And okay. we're at startengine.com backslash aquapour so start engine is uh it's a good crowdfunding platform um they do a good job and we've enjoyed um you know putting our offering on their on their platform so that's where we're at um and folks can go check it out there you can check out aquapour at our website aquapour.com and we're on instagram and facebook x what else all the things tiktok yeah. A-Q-I- A-Q-U-I-P-O-R.com. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's right. Well, I look forward to seeing um, the commercialization of this idea and also your sister company. I'm very fast. I'll, I'll be interested to see the updates there and um, when you can really start impacting infrastructure at a broad scale. It'll be awesome. Yeah. That's going to be a cool one. And hopefully we have some announcements on that front too. That company cool. is doing some amazing things. Nice. Um, and they've been in stealth. So they kind of, they're going to come out from behind the curtain here soon, hopefully. Awesome. It'd well, be cool. it has uh, been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Greg. I think it's super cool. I knew from the moment that I discovered you that it was an awesome concept. I believe that even more so now. It's another one of those triple bottom line things, reducing waste from one industry, you know, reducing CO2, reducing and capturing rainwater. You're ticking a lot of boxes, which is just which is just awesome. And it's interesting how these great solutions seem to do that. They seem to impact multiple industries at the same time in a positive way. And, you know, if, if you were to hit on any one of those, I think it would be worth it. Right. But certainly getting all of them together, it's just massive. So, yeah. well, I stuff. really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it. I, it's, it's I appreciate. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I, Again, appreciate you having me, uh, Ross, and shining a light. I think that's you're doing um, 
some really valuable things by shining the light on people trying to work on these things. And I think the more of that, the better, because again, you know, we're doing our thing and, and that's cool, but I think there are so many bright minds working on really hard challenges right now that uh, can make a really big impact and um, they need to have the spotlight on them. Well, that makes me feel good. So thank you for that. Yeah. I appreciate that more than you know. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure, Craig. And with that, uh, the official podcast. So. Oh.